I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome back to Dementia Matters. I'm here with Dr. Howard Weiner, Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and Co-Director of the Ann Romney Center for Neurologic Diseases at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. In November 2021, Brigham and Women's Hospital launched a clinical trial for a nasal vaccine intended to prevent and slow the progression of Alzheimer's disease. The culmination of 20 years of research This is the first human trial for Alzheimer's intranasal vaccine targeting the immune system and could open a new avenue for potentially treating Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Dr. Weiner, welcome to Dementia Matters. Thank you. Great to be here. I like to begin these interviews with understanding the why behind our country's important scientists. So for you, Dr. Weiner, why Alzheimer's disease? And why work in immune function or dysfunction? In essence, how did you get here? So there's two or three parts to the answer. The I'll go to the uh, second question first. I'm very interested in neurologic diseases. Uh, the primary disease I began with was multiple sclerosis, which is an immune-mediated disease. So we really applied everything we know about immunology to MS. Now, in our Center for Neurologic Diseases, we study other diseases, And it became clear that Alzheimer's could also have immune components, although it isn't an immune-driven disease like MS. When there was a trial uh, in the year 2000 of immunizing Alzheimer's patients with beta amyloid, many of the patients developed an encephalitis uh, that uh, was very similar to MS, and the trial was stopped. So being an MS doctor and doing research in that area, that really piqued my interest in terms of how the immune system might be involved. At the same time, on a personal level, my mother had Alzheimer's, and so I witnessed it firsthand. And of course, anytime you have a personal connection to a disease, it gives you more reason to want to study it or whatever. In fact, when my mother had it, uh, she said to me, Howard, you're a brain doctor. Can't you help me? Kind of interesting. Of course, I couldn't. You know, at that time, we didn't know anything, but I, I always remembered that. She's passed on subsequently. So when we began to study this event in Alzheimer's patients that got the encephalitis, and this is the 20 years of work, and I won't go into all the scientific steps, it became clear that the immune system itself could be used to treat Alzheimer's and clear beta amyloid. Now, the major trials that have been used in Alzheimer's have been giving a monoclonal antibody that reacts with A-beta, and there have been many, many trials We know the study of the aducanumab. I won't get into the controversy on that unless you want to talk about it. But I was more interested in the immune system itself and particularly cells of the immune system, such as macrophages and monocytes. And in the encephalitis that occurred in the Alzheimer's patients almost 20 years ago, there was some evidence of amyloid clearance. And in the laboratory, we discovered that you could treat animal models by inducing an immune response that affected monocytes and macrophages that went to the brain and cleared out the amyloid. So we published about four papers on this. And so then it was, can we do this in people? That's a great answer, Dr. Weiner. But one of my questions for you, you've pioneered some really key work using immunotherapy and the mucosal immune system for the treatment of multiple sclerosis autoimmune diseases, and other diseases like ALS and Huntington's. So how do you see Alzheimer's disease fitting into this paradigm or this approach, knowing, as you just said, that the immune system isn't the primary cause or the immune dysfunction isn't the primary cause of Alzheimer's, but certainly is a component potentially? Well, I think that we now know that the immune system has healing, reparative, or treatment qualities. You know, after you clear a bacterial infection, the immune system can repair different tissues. After people have heart attacks, macrophages go into the heart and repair things. So this could apply to the brain as well. And there could be immune cells that can be reparative or homeostatic for the brain. So that's that idea. The other point is that the major immune cell in the brain is a microglial cell. The microglial cells is a primary immune cell. The 
the brain has its own immune system. And many people feel that the microglial cells can be both protective or damaging in Alzheimer's, in ALS. It's a common theme. So if that's true, if you can modulate microglial cells, it could help all of these diseases, including Alzheimer's and ALS, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, etc. And when people think of the immune system, they sometimes will then think of inflammation. And there's always a lot of talk about inflammation being a potential mechanism somewhere in the spectrum of Alzheimer's pathology. Based on the things that you have been doing, do you have a suspicion as to inflammation and how it relates to amyloid, whether it's a potential cause or some mechanism after amyloid has developed? So again, it depends on how you define inflammation. I think there can be good inflammation and bad inflammation. I think that the microglia, after the amyloid is deposited, the microglia can become toxic. And microglial cells are inflammatory cells, and I think that's bad, okay? Earlier on in the disease, the microglia can be good, if you will, because they can clear amyloid and prevent us from getting Alzheimer's. Now, the immune system is constantly patrolling the body and protecting us. In fact, in cancer, one of the reasons we get cancer as we get older is that the immune system doesn't become as effective because during our lives, the immune system is clearing out cancer cells. There are abnormal cells and they're clearing it out. And I think the immune system is also clearing out the abnormal amyloid that occurs as we get older. And then as we get older, it isn't as effective. So the immune system loses its protective inflammatory component and then develops in the brain itself a detrimental inflammatory component in response to amyloid. So tell us about the vaccine and its immune modulator Protolin, or correct Protolin. me if I'm wrong, Protolin, yeah. that, you're, that you're studying. What exactly is it? And then how does it work specifically? The vaccine itself is actually a combination. It's called Protolin. So Protolin is a adjuvant. An adjuvant is used to stimulate the immune system to get a response. It was used initially in people for Shigella vaccines, used for influenza vaccines. It's a compound that has outer membrane vesicles from an LPS from Shigella and Neisseria. That's how it was put together. Uh, so that's what protolin is. Uh, adjuvants stimulate the immune system by stimulating the innate immune system, uh, such as monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells. And the protolin stimulates these cells via TLR2 and TLR4 ligands. That's how it works. So it, it elicits a strong immune response. We had really beautiful results in animals, really beautiful results understood the mechanism. And so then it was, can we do this in people? When you want to treat people, it isn't easy. Uh, you have to be able to manufacture it. You have to have the funds. You have to get FDA approval. So it took a few years, but we did succeed. And we then treated our first patient with this nasal vaccine in November. Uh, and now we've treated our second and third patient. And it's going along very nicely. Many of my colleagues are optimistic that stimulating the immune system in this way to have the body itself fight off the Alzheimer's has a good chance of success. But of course, you know, the proof is in the pudding. We'll see what happens. So when you say innate immune system, that's that immediate response that isn't one the, of the memory cells that we traditionally think of uh, when we think of vaccines later on and reoccurring exposures. Right. The innate, the immune system has an, is the innate and the adaptive. Okay. The adaptive immune system has specificity. So antibodies are part of the adaptive immune system specific for COVID, polio, whatever. There's also adaptive T cells, part of the adaptive immune system. But in order for the adaptive immune system to get stimulated, the innate immune system has to help it along. And it's so the it's kind of the immediate immune response. What it does is it gets the immune system activated and then the adaptive immune system comes in. And the vaccine will trigger an immune response to beta amyloid in the brain. So how do you, how do you know that the body's immune response is actually going to go specifically to the brain and, and attach to beta amyloid? So that's a good question. We know because of experiments, okay? We know that both macrophages and T cells are patrolling the body all the time. They're already patrolling the body. And we have beautiful data in the animals that if you stimulate the 
innate immune system, macrophages with protolin in the periphery, those cells will go to the brain and clear the amyloid. In fact, we can take a mouse, give it the nasal protolin, take out immune cells, and give those immune cells to another mouse, and those cells will go into the brain and clear the amyloid in the other, in the other animal. So we know that one of the features of the immune system is the constant patrolling of the body. So it goes in and out of all the tissues. It also speaks to the importance of all of the other work leading up to this this particular trial and the 20 years of research and understanding all of these different pathways and mechanisms. This particular one that we're talking about is a phase one study. For our audience, what exactly are the goals and are there any particular side effects that you're looking at specifically or potentially anticipating? So a phase one study is to make sure the drug is safe and to find out what's the best dose, okay? We don't expect it to not be safe because it's already been given to people. We don't expect any side effects, but it's never been given to people with Alzheimer's. So you don't know. They could have an idiosyncratic reaction or something. We have to monitor them very carefully. They get a dose. They have blood pressure, EKGs, blood tests, everything. With some drugs, there might be certain side effects that you expect. Maybe there's a drug that you want to treat something in the brain, but it interacts with something in the heart. So you wonder whether you'll get a heart side effect. We don't expect any side effects, but we want to find out what dose to use in the phase two trial. So we're going to give four doses. We start with the lowest dose. We give it to three people. We give it a group of four. Three people get it. Three people get a placebo. We'll draw blood on them. If there's no side effects, we go up to the next dose. The first dose is like 100. The next is 500. The next is 1,000. The next is 1,500. Then we take blood samples and we look at the monocytes or macrophages to see whether they've been stimulated. And that'll tell us what dose to give when we do the next trial. Sort of like a COVID, and we're giving, we're giving two doses, two doses. Sort of like a COVID vaccine, they're given two weeks apart. And like in a COVID vaccine, you'll measure antibodies against COVID. Here we'll measure stimulation of monocytes. So once we get the dose, you're probably gonna ask this question, but I'll answer it anyway. What do you do next? <laughs> okay. So once we have the dose, we'll then probably take about 150 people who have Alzheimer's and we'll give them one or two doses and there'll be a placebo group. They'll be treated for a year and then we'll measure amyloid in the brain and cognition and everything. So that'll be a big study to show that it has some effect on Alzheimer's. And if things work out and that's positive, you would then move to a phase three trial, which is a big trial. That's like thousands of patients for FDA uh, approval and licensing. And that's often when people can do it across the country. So you might have multiple sites for that bigger well, trial. I'll, I think we'll have multiple sites for the phase two trial. Because if you have 150 patients, you need more than one hospital. Now, you talk about the participants and you did mention those with Alzheimer's disease. Can you describe sort of what you're looking at right now for this phase one, the type of individual who's enrolling, and have you had any trouble with recruitment? So we, these are mild Alzheimer's patients. So they have an MMSE of like 20 to 29. That's what their thing is. We haven't had a trouble recruiting, as you may have known, your listeners may know, the hospital actually put out a press release that we're gonna do this. I, you know, they just kind of put it out. I didn't even know about it uh, per se, and it really created a stir. I was quite surprised. And it became very a, a great interest to people around the world. And so a lot of patients heard about it. So because of that, we haven't had any trouble recruiting people. If there's anyone listening who wants to participate, there's numbers that they can call. But I think the interest from the press and the people shows how important Alzheimer's is and something like a nasal vaccine that has the potential to have widespread implications on Alzheimer uh, caught the public attention. And you did mention that currently there's the, we're looking at monoclonal antibodies and that and aducanumab has made a lot of news. But just taking it from a general perspective, you know, why would a vaccine be potentially better as far as an approach to treatment than something like a monoclonal antibody? Well, I think that of course, I won't get into the controversy on aducanumab unless you want to talk about it. But 
There's a lot of studies using monoclonal antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies have been very successful in medicine. So we hope it works. Uh, I've worked in multiple sclerosis, and I was on a call with the Alzheimer's scientists and MS scientists and everything. And if you look at MS, over the last 20 years, there's 15 approved drugs for MS. And it started with one and just gets better and better. And I think that's where we are in terms of Alzheimer's. With all the people in the world with Alzheimer's, you can't make enough monoclonal antibody to treat everybody, quite frankly. And a nasal vaccine that you give a spray, you know, that could be given to large segments of the population. I think ultimately we want something more than a monoclonal antibody. Also, this could be used not only to treat, but in a preventative way. So we're hoping the monoclonal antibodies will work. There's more coming. We hope that it'll give some relief to some of the Alzheimer's patients. But I view that as a beginning. And I think that the nasal vaccine has a better long-term uh, applicability, although it could be used in combination. Yeah, you really know how to answer the questions I'm about to ask you, Dr. Weiner. And so this idea that, I mean, this is our own body that's fighting elevated amyloid proteins in the brain. So that leads me to think of prevention, this idea that if you're at high risk, you're asymptomatic, but you have elevated amyloid, or maybe you're just at the cusp of developing elevated amyloid. I mean, do you see this as a potential route of for healthy people who have elevated proteins in their brain? Absolutely. No question about it. Think about it in terms of high blood pressure, okay? We treat people with high blood pressure because we want to prevent stroke and heart attacks. They don't have a problem. If your blood pressure is 140 over 100, you don't feel anything. But if you don't do anything, you're going to get... Um, so the same thing is true. There are people, we now know, that people in their 50s, 60s, they're beginning to develop Alzheimer's and they don't know it. They have amyloid in the brain, just like someone has elevated blood pressure. And I think that's how we're ultimately going to cure Alzheimer's, not by treating people who have it, but by treating people early. The other interesting thing is that we've used amyloid PET imaging to identify these people. Now there's blood tests, some phosphorylated tau, other amyloid blood tests. And those blood tests could be given to large segments of the population, identify people who are at risk, in fact, not necessarily at risk, identify people who have the equivalent of high blood pressure and treat their high blood pressure. And so in that sense, a nasal vaccine, I think that's ultimately what's going to happen. In fact, one of the doctors at our hospital, Risa Sperling, is treating asymptomatic Alzheimer's or asymptomatic cognitively normal with monoclonal antibodies. Of course, it's an academic trial. I, that, I don't think that could be widely used. Yeah, so, and we're having Dr. Sperling on this show, and so we'll be talking about the AHEAD study, which we're a site for yeah. as well. Do you think then vaccines, potentially there could be a vaccine to tau protein, which causes other things besides Alzheimer's disease? Is that is that something that's possible? Absolutely. No question. Okay. Yeah. And so then I know you answered this question earlier, but why nasal versus a muscle. When you think of the vaccine, most of us are used to an injection into our muscle for COVID or the flu. Why the nasal route? We chose the nasal route because it's a natural route of stimulating the immune system. And it also isn't as toxic as uh, stimulating the immune system, say by the intravenous or the subcutaneous route. We didn't do it to get the treatment in the brain. Some people think you're giving it nasally because you're trying to get it in the brain. The vaccine we use does not go into the brain, but it uses the nasal route because it's more physiologic. So that's the basic reason. We think you'll get an immune response that's more physiologic, that can help the body with less side effects. And then to end, my last question for you is, can you share with us a little bit about your documentary, What is Life, the movie? So I was a philosophy major in college. And there's all these big questions, you know. I don't have to tell you, you know, is there a God? Why is there evil? Where did we come from? What came before the Big Bang? You really can't study those things um, in the lab. And I've had an interest in the arts. My son actually is an Emmy Award-winning comedy writer. He wrote for 30 Rock and Silicon Valley. So uh, he encouraged me. And so I made a movie where I go around the world and I ask life's big questions and ask them for different people and try to explore what life's big questions are. I don't try to proselytize. I don't try to say you should believe in God. You should, 
I wanted to raise what the questions were so that, you know, you ask, you know, is there a God? So obviously when I asked a priest or a rabbi, you know, they gave an answer. When I ask a physicist, they gave an answer. You know what I mean? There's funny answers, you know, do you have a unique soulmate? You know, you get different answers for that. One of my responders says, I hope there's more than one. Do you know what I mean? And um, so it won Los Angeles Film Awards. It's called What Is Life? The Movie. You can view it on YouTube. But I actually went on to make another movie called, it's actually a Hollywood movie that came out a couple of years ago called Abe and Phil's Last Poker Game. So that's a movie I made with Martin Lando and Paul Sorvino. And it uh, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. It's streaming. People can watch it. Now, we're talking about Alzheimer's. One of the main characters has Alzheimer's. So the story of Abe and Phil's last poker game is an old Jewish doctor goes to a home because his wife has Alzheimer's. And there he meets an old Italian. And that's played by Martin Lando. And there he meets an old Italian guy who was a womanizer and a gambler. And that's played by Paul Sorvino. So they become friends improbable friends. And then there's a story of a nurse in the nursing home who's adopted and she got, had a note that her father is there and she wants to know who her uh, biologic father is. So she meets these two old guys and they both want to be her father. So it's a very nice story. Uh, one of the, the doctors married to someone with Alzheimer's and it's a very poignant picture of his relationship with his wife, what she understands, what she doesn't understand. She's connected to a fur coat. Uh, she wonders what he's doing. He finds himself as a doctor with people who don't remember things or whatever. So it was a very nice, it, was, it, it premiered at Tribeca. In my office, I have a picture of myself with Robert De Niro because he runs Tribeca. So it was a lot of fun and it relates to dementia and Alzheimer's. So there you go. It's streaming. Abe and Phil's last poker game. People can uh, uh, watch that as well. Well, that's incredible. And while initially it, it seemed a bit of a, a difficult thing to get, but a philosophy major and then neurology that studies the brain and the brain's amazing function, Alzheimer's disease, and then creativity with your artwork. I guess it all does really make sense, Dr. Weiner. I think it does. It does. I see that. And I, uh, I have other movies planned and they deal with the brain and they deal with philosophy. And then this book that I wrote, The Brain Under Siege, I wrote that to try and tell stories about these diseases that people could understand. Well, thank you for your time today. And I would love to have you back on the show. We can talk about one of your other pro uh, projects, whether it is scientific study or your writing. Thank you for having me. I'm always uh, happy to join. Thank you for listening to Dementia Matters. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts to be notified about upcoming episodes. You can also listen to our show by asking your smart speaker to play the Dementia Matters podcast. And please rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research, Education, and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode of Dementia Matters was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Kaylin Rowerdink. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. To learn more about the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Dementia Matters, check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. Follow us on Facebook at Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and find us on Twitter at Wisconsin ADRC. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.